Bonjour. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our My First Mentor panel. Um, I, will, I will confess that I am not wearing the normal uniform of the United States Ambassador to Canada. Um, you can see that I'm wearing a Canada soccer jersey, um, and that is because I am an honorable person and not a sore loser. But when Canada beat the United States on Sunday in a World Cup qualifying match, I had bet the uh, Canadian ambassador to the U.S. that the ambassador of the losing team would wear the jersey of the winning team for one day. And this is my day to wear the jersey. Also, because Canada's next game is against El Salvador tonight, and I want to express my full-throated enthusiasm and rooting interest in Canada winning tonight as well. So February is an opportunity for us to celebrate the Black community in both Canada and the U.S. and to highlight that community's contributions in both of our societies. Since arriving in Canada two months ago, I have made it a priority for the United States Embassy and consulates in Canada to seek out opportunities to promote diversity, inclusion, and equity, including for Canadians of African descent. Both of our countries are open democratic societies which indisputably benefit tremendously from diversity, but that's not enough. We also need to ensure that all Americans and Canadians feel included in society and have equal opportunities. So I'm very pleased to kick off U.S. Consulate Montreal's celebration of Black History Month, which is with a subject that is near and dear to my heart, mentorship. I've enjoyed the benefits of mentorship over the course of my career, but even more compelling is that from my own experience as a mentor, I invariably feel that I have benefited just as much, if not more, than the person I was mentoring. It's the ultimate win-win. So now let me turn the program over to my colleague, our outstanding U.S. Consul General in Montreal, Anna Eskrajima, to introduce the panelists and to moderate the discussion. Thank you all for being here today. Merci. Thank you, Ambassador Cohen, for your introduction and for your great sportsmanship. <laughs> While February is, of course, an opportunity uh, to uplift Black perspectives and Black contributions to the world, this is not limited, of course, to one month of the year. This event is part of a series of initiatives at the U.S. Consul General in Montreal uh, that we've created to promote diversity and inclusion in all of our programming and policy engagement throughout the year. Now for today's panel, we are thrilled to welcome four professionals from a range of backgrounds, academia, public relations, public service, and the social entrepreneurship space for what I know will be a great conversation on mentorship, which of course is a critical piece of ensuring inclusion. Their full bios are available on our Instagram page at US Cons Montreal, so please check them out. Today, we are honored to have with us Terry Givens, professor of political science at McGill University and founder of Brighter Higher Ed, David Shelton, battalion chief at the Montreal Fire Department, Martine Saint-Victor, general manager at Edelman Montreal, and Fabrice Ville, founder of Pour Trois Points. To everyone watching via Facebook, please use the chat function to interact with us and send us your questions. We want this to be an interactive discussion and we will weave them in throughout the event. And panelists, thank you all for accepting uh, our invitation to share a bit about mentorship and your first mentor with our audience. Terry, let's start with you. Can you please tell us a bit about yourself and who your first mentor was? So yes, I'm a professor at McGill, as you mentioned, and actually I I'm from the United States. I uh, grew up in a town called Spokane, Washington, which is not far from the Canadian border. And I also spent some time in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, which is in the Upper Peninsula. So I feel a kinship with Canada. Um, but I, um, you know, when I think about my first mentor, I'm the youngest of seven, and I have four sisters and two brothers, and 
you know, really they were the ones who were my initial role models in life. And they really helped me to, you know, from everything from when I was little, taking me to the library and helping me learn to read up to, you know, being really important role models as I became a mother and, you know, was trying to pursue the, the balancing a career and having a family. And so I really look at my sisters in particular as um, my first mentors, but I've had many, many people throughout my life who I like to say, and I mentioned in my book, Radical Empathy, um, actually saw more in me than I necessarily saw in myself. And so my mentors are really important in as a first generation college goer, encouraging me to pursue um, higher education and uh, to pursue the various positions I've been able to, help to hold throughout my life. So I'll end there. Thanks. Oh, Who do you want to send it to? Oh, now Siri wants to be involved. Sorry, I was, I've just unmuted myself. Uh, David, how about we turn it over to you? Sure. Um, so I, I also am a U.S. citizen, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Um, and uh, like Terry, you know, mentorship exists in so many different realms. You know, there's life mentoring, there's professional mentoring, there's you know, sports, it can be uh, uh, any, any different discipline. And my family uh, were my first mentors as well, my very first. But uh, before I get to go further, let me, let me thank you uh, so much, um, Council General Esquihima, for having this event and your staff for putting it together and for giving me a reason to look back over that history of mentorship in my own life, because it's been a real treat to revisit those ideas and look back at all the people who helped guide me uh, along the way. And um, so I've done a lot of things. I'm, I just retired from the fire department. I also was a visual artist before that. I also uh, studied biology and in each and many other things. And in each of these realms, I sort of had a first mentor. So uh, in my thinking about this today, I decided to talk about two of them. Uh, one of them is named a uh, gentleman named Hester Wheeler. When I came into the fire service originally for the city of Detroit fire department, it was a difficult time for race relations in the department. And I came into a workplace that was somewhat hostile uh, to me. And so um, this gentleman who worked at a neighboring fire station um, recognized that I, need, I could use some support. And he uh, took the initiative to step in and offer me the sort of guidance that I was looking for and offer me that support. It was a courageous move on his part because he, um, you know, it was taking a bit of a, of a chance. It was a issue of, you know, giving advice to someone else's rookie, if you will. But uh, he, he, he took the initiative to step in and fill a gap that I so sorely needed. And it was a courageous move, like I said, and I really appreciate it. Um, I, I wanted to choose another first mentor. Um, you asked me to do about a, a short, a little, maybe five minutes. And this was a wonderful woman in my life. When I was in university, um, I was a very serious student. I had tried entrepreneurship. I had tried a couple of things and then I chose a new direction and it was to go to university. In university, I worked very hard and I did well. And then uh, I was elected to uh, an influential position as student government president. I didn't feel particularly prepared for it because I was in, in pure and applied sciences and this was more a polit political science in the whole world that was not familiar to me. And so uh, I sought support and uh, I stopped into a bookstore and cultural center um, in Detroit, well known, they also exist in, in Houston and elsewhere, the Shrine of the, Black Madonna, Shrine of the Black Madonna Bookstore and Cultural Center. And I met Ayili. Ayili was a phenomenal woman who was a, a very well read and, and knew the entire canon of black literature. And she guided me, she talked to me, she listened to my needs, uh, she, um, she encouraged me and she would give me, you know, three or four or five books to read and I'd go off and read those, come back and talk about them and talk about my new problems or whatever I was facing at the time, she'd give me more to read or more to do or some encouraging words. And so, um, yeah, she was, she was a, a game changer. And I feel like in many ways, she, she really changed my life, uh, you know, tremendously. And I, I greatly appreciate her. Um, the third person I want to mention was my first academic 
uh, mentor. And he was a man who did not take kindly to me when I first came into his class because I was a street, I was, I was kind of a streety guy. And this was an academic guy from an Ivy League college and he was not fond of my way of being or dressing or moving. So he, uh, you know, he gave me a hard time, but I was determined to do well. So I worked super hard. I went to his office hours. I explained to him that I was there to learn everything he had to teach me. And eventually I won him over and got to be, you know, sort of a, a protege of his and tutor all of his classes. And, uh, and it was a great relationship thereafter. So there was a person that I, you know, two that I sought out and one that sought me out to offer support. Hmm. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing. Martine. Yes, hello. Um, I'm Martine Saint-Victor. I head the um, Montreal office of Edelman, which is the largest communications firm in the world. Um, at heart, I am a communication strategist, also an American file. So to be on this platform is quite a treat for me. Uh, thank you for having me. I um, was born in Quebec and my it took me a long time to realize that my, my mother and her sisters were um, my first mentors. It took me a long, long time. And the reason why it took me a long time is that it took a while to recognize the tools that they passed on. And so um, my parents immigrated from Haiti to Canada 55 years ago. And my mom's sisters also immigrated either uh, in the US or Canada. And the tools they gave me were the ability to um, navigate a world where they were a minority. And I never heard them complain. And the reason why I mentioned that is because it takes a lot of strength sometimes to move forward and to kind of put blinders and keep the eye on the ball, keep your eye on the ball and not be distracted by things that are often not so great. Um, I think that's the difference between the generation of our parents and the, the younger generation today uh, that has the tool that can voice uh, disagreement, that can voice injustice. It was more difficult in the 60s. And so I, I use that as a tool to, rem to remind myself that despite hurdles sometimes, if we keep our eye on the ball, we'll, we'll, we'll reach the objective and also looking at my 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 mother and her sisters and my father as well I, I don't want to ignore him but uh, as you know oftentimes women carry more uh, of the load um, it watching my parents and 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 my the elders in my family was a reminder that we really do have more in common than not and so when you have this, generation that arrived from a country like Haiti and came to Canada or came to the US uh, and they were both able to make it, it, it's a testament to that, that we do have more in common. And so um, they were my, my, my first mentors and, and I regret that it took me so long to recognize it. Thank you. Thank so you many so great themes that I, uh, I, I hope we can return to throughout the discussion. Fabrice. Yes, uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's really an honor. Um, I would, uh, so yeah, my name is Fabrice and I, I founded Pour Trois Points, which is an organization that um, trains sports coaches so that these coaches um, learn how to better support youth, especially youth in low-income uh, neighborhoods. So there's really an aspect of mentorship in the work that we do. Um, and, and I guess I would start by saying that the idea of Pour Trois Points, which is now in its 10th year of, uh, 11th year, we have 10 years of existence. Now we are in, in our 11th year, um, is rooted in my personal experience of having coaches who have been there for me um, as mentors. So certainly it would be a crime for me not to mention Zivan Zik, who has been my first basketball coach and who um, really was a tough coach um, uh, and was really focused on discipline and, and, and effort but at the same time, supporting me uh, as, a, as a young child, when I was started playing basketball, I was 11 years old and I was not that really confident. And he was one of them supporting me in the way I gained confidence, not only on the court, but that translated in, into other aspects of my life. Um, and then again, beyond my, my coaches, and, and there have been others who acted as mentors, 
I would say that um, similarly to uh, my, my co-panelists, uh, family has been the, the, the nest of, of, of so much mentorship. And Maxine, when you say that you, it took a while for you to, fit, to, um, to realize that, it's been similar to me. Um, my, um, I grew up at home with my two parents, but also my, my mother's parents, so my, my grandparents on my mother's side were also present. So I had four parents at home and I, my grandfather was um, my very first mentor, I would say beyond my parents, because um, I think he showed me both in, in, in speech and actions um, what it meant to be there for a whole group. And in, in our case, it, it, it meant my family. And, and he, he really resonated as being um, the one in the way he carried himself and the way he, he, he didn't, he wasn't a man of many words, but every time he spoke, he spoke to mean something. So that really, really resonated with me. So that's one aspect. And the last person that I would mention is my aunt, um, uh, Madeleine Fikia, who um, is uh, uh, also from Haiti. Obviously, I didn't mention that I'm from uh, um, Haiti originally. My parents came in, this, in the 70s. And she, uh, she, she, she is um, making a career in the business community. And she's also my godmother. So she's always been present for me and my brothers and my cousins in supporting us in navigating our professional career um, and which in my case brought this more, not more, well, yeah, it was specific. It brought some value because she was the only one that was not, um, whether it be in the health system or the engineering system. So it was quite new in my family to have someone in the business community. So she really, really helped me navigate through that environment. And I would end by saying that she's been a sponsor as well. And she's still to this day, every time she thinks of someone that I should meet, she doesn't hesitate to put me in contact with that person so I can uh, pursue my own dreams. So I'm really grateful for that. Thank you so much, Fabrice. Uh, our panelists may already be aware, but uh, just to share with our audience that actually the theme of this Black History Month in the United States is health and wellness. Um, and so I appreciate you, you bringing forth your, your mentorship in the sports coaching uh, arena. I, uh, it's clear from all of your bios that you all have uh, blazed many trails um, and have created pathways for people uh, coming by your side or behind you. Um, and so I wanted to uh, have this first uh, question uh, and open it up to whoever would like to answer first. Do you feel that mentorship, how, how particularly important was it for you, um, whether you were starting a new career or whether you were kind of young, you know, kind of younger in life, being from a different background, you know, being from the black community. Um, I was still shamelessly from uh, something Ambassador Cohen uh, likes to say, which is if you can, if you can see it, you can become it, right? Um, and so uh, whether it's people who see it in us or actually people who are doing what we would like to do and we see them doing that and are inspired to do the same, I wondered if, if you all could, could speak to that a bit. Um, I, I think the coming from um, a different background is, and this is why I, I, I say that I regret it took me so long to recognize the legacy that my parents uh, built, which was to make it in a place where no one looks like you, but also to realize that you have to be, if you want to be part of it, you have to make an effort, right? Um, and so, you know, I've had mentors, one of my most influential, influence, influential mentor, who's still my mentor today, his name is Andy Nolman, and he might be watching, I don't know. But Andy is from, um, where obviously not the same gender, not the same generation, he's older, and uh, not the same um, ethnic background. And what that has done is that it has kind of eliminated, you know, when I would, when I, when I reach for his counsel, we, we don't even talk about that aspect because I don't, it doesn't define me. That aspect of who I am does not define me. Sometimes I, ch I choose to define, to define, I choose to define myself as, uh, as black. It depends on the, on the moment, but when you have a mentor that comes from a different background, the richness in that is that you can, you can project what you can do differently. 
but as equally important is to have a mentor that has walked the path that you're trying to walk. So you can't, you know how they say in relationships, you, you can get everything out of one person. It's a, it's a little bit the same thing with mentorship. Um, you have to be, it's better to have more than one uh, part because as, as a person, we're, we're more than one thing. And that I think is, is the success to being surrounded by the right people is to recognize the, the layers that we have and then have the people who can speak to each of these layers differently. Um, I could go next, or sorry, Fabrice, but um, in any case, I'll be quick. I just wanted to follow up on what Martine had to say because I have had many mentors who were in positions that you know, saw that I could potentially someday be in that position. And so, for example, when I was at the um, University of Texas at Austin, my dean um, was one of the people who, very, when I first got to uh, UT, was uh, invited me to his home and introduced me. You know, is what Fabrice was saying about sponsorship. You know, mentorship is one thing where you give people advice and so on, but sponsorship is when you create the connections. And not only that, you know, invite somebody, you know, I was uh, asked to become a vice provost when I was at UT Austin. And um, it was because of all of the connections I had made around the campus with the upper leadership and, and with my dean. And because those connections were started almost from, you know, the minute I got to campus and people saw that I had potential, um, it was, that was very important that they then put me in a position to take on a leadership role in a very high leadership role at the institution. So, um, and, you know, there weren't very many people in, you know, the higher administration who were black, but, you know, those who were, you know, I could see, you know, there were, were potential uh, role models there, but there, there's almost a hierarchy, you know, there's role models and people who are, have representation, there's mentors who, um, you know, can give you advice, and then there's sponsors who actually take action and give you the opportunities to do things that you might not have otherwise had access to. So I think that's uh, an important component of it. Yeah, and in connection to that, what I would say is that um, um, my family really has helped me navigate um, life as a, as a person, uh, a Montreal of Haitian or origin and a black person without me noticing it in the way they, they carried themselves and, I, and, and, and that notion of navigating life without even talking about it. I think I just had an example on that specific front. But beyond that, um, I would also add that I never had any black teacher. I never, need, and I never had any black coach. And I do believe that on that front, it is necessary in, in the education sector to have uh, you know, a more diverse body uh, because representation is important. So that I would mention. And without contradicting that mention, I also think of the value all the, of all the mentors that I've had beyond what I had at home. And, and um, none of them, uh, if not, uh, well, yeah, most of them were not Black or were not Haitian. They were, I chose them because of their professional uh, background, because of their, their wisdom, because of what they could they could bring so i really agree well it's not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing yeah it's a matter of resonating with the idea that uh, none of my mentors really uh, outside of home brought value in light of their identity um and the last mention is and going back to the notion of sponsorship beyond mentorship when i uh, i made a career I, I worked as a lawyer for five years and a half and, and the lack of presence of Black people in that specific sector made it particularly important for Black lawyers to sponsor younger ones. So I, really I remember my first interview for law firm, it was uh, a Black uh, lawyer called Stéphanie Raymond Bougie, who's still highly involved in the business community. And I could really tell that she cared about myself succeeding as a lawyer. So that notion went beyond mentorship, or it was, it was slightly different. And I believe that that I, I I do believe that there's a lot of value because in places where people are underrepresented, those who actually put their 
their, their handout and help the, the younger generation uh, succeed. That's an aspect that we that is not specifically related to mentorship, but is key in, in, in how a community can actually thrive and succeed. Thank you. I want to go back to a point Martin made about the importance of having um, many different mentors in your life because there are so many different phases of our life or aspects of, of which, what we're trying to do. And I wondered if um, maybe, David, we could start with you, if we could talk about the life cycle of a mentorship relationship. I mean, maybe at one phase in your career or life, a mentor is like you're everything, you know, but then as you kind of move on and do other things, how do you what advice would you give our audience about continuing to manage and maintain relationships with mentors um, throughout the life cycle of the relationship? So um, thank you for that, um, Council General. I, um, I agree entirely that it, you know, to me, I see it as almost, you know, how they say it takes a village to raise a child. You know, I feel that this, this sort of group of mentors that, that, that we have in our lives um, are a con con continuation of that, you know, and I know uh, that uh, in my case, you know, many of the mentors that I, I'm still in touch with, so many of the mentors that I had in the past. Also, I'd say that this, these mentorship relationships are often born out of our curiosity, out of our passion, out of our drive, out of our, uh, our seeking to develop ourselves in a particular direction. And so, it's normal that that we have you know different mentors at different times that help us with with different aspects of our lives, and I um, you know I'm it's like another level of family, I uh, I you know to speak to your point earlier of people who look like us and you know if we can see it we can we can become it. I was very fortunate. My adoptive father was. Um, a military man. He was a commissioned uh, officer in the Second World War, African American in a segregated U.S. Army, and he went through a, a great many things. Uh, and he was able to guide me a lot as I was entering into this paramilitary realm, where you know black people were underrepresented, and that was priceless because he was able to give me a heads up. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, a friend's father, he said this is true of mentors as well. He said, your children will hear what you said seven years after you say it. <laughs> so, so, you know, so many things that my father told me, um, I was thirsty. I was trying to listen. I was trying to understand, but, uh, you know, it was not until I bumped into that issue uh, and had to live through it myself that I realized, really understood, oh, that's what he was talking about, you know? Uh, and so, um, you know, that's on that front. But also, like Fabrice uh, was saying, many of my mentors do, do not come from my background, but it's based on entirely on trying to become, you know, the most knowledgeable uh, a biological, you know, a student in, in, in the study of biology that I could become, that this pursuit brought us together. And I think, you know, in this time, it's so important that people reach across these gender and racial boundaries to offer support to bright young people who are looking uh, for that guidance, because that's what, that's what, that's what it's all about. Thank you. Would any of our other panelists like to comment on the life cycle? Okay, Terry, over to you. Well, it's interesting because as a you know as a professor and uh, you know at most of the institution, I've, I've been at predominantly white institutions for all of my career, and so oftentimes um, st you know students of color, but you know not just students of color, but many students you know reach out and want to make those connections. And what I've found is really interesting is, you know, I've, I've made a strong connection. So I, I really believe in mentoring my students and, and helping them to make whatever next step uh, they want to make. And so I've seen my students go from, you know, being in their freshman year of college to, uh, on to their first job, on to becoming parent. I mean, I have, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I use Facebook. So I have so many of my students who, um, I'm connected with still via Facebook. And so it, it's interesting because I think, you know, as they're, you know, kind of going through their different life phases, um, you know, you come in, in and out at, at different times, but also you get to the point where you're colleagues. 
And so like with some of my mentors, you know, now we're, we're colleagues and, and friends mm -hmm. and, and the same is true of the students and, and other people I've mentored through the years. And so I think one of the important things is to keep in mind that, you know, it doesn't have to be the same relationship over time and that there comes a point where, you know, there, well, there's always a point where you're learning from each other. I mean, I've learned so much from my, I, even now I'm, you know, when, when I'm teaching, I'm learning from my students uh, every day, but um, it's, it, the, you know, th those, I really treasure those relationships that either I started off as a mentee and now we're, we're friends or I started off the, as a mentor and now, you know, we're friends and have a, you know, a very uh, close connection that, that remains throughout the years. Probably one quick comment that I would make is that um, when we look at mentorship, um, it can be defined as having a formal start and a formal end. And, you know, in professional settings, we often see that. Um, and I've had that twice in my, in my journey in terms of a formal uh, assigned mentorship program or um, uh, configuration. But I would say that the, 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 the richest mentorship relationships that I've had have always been informal where I didn't even know that it was a mentorship relationship that started that, or ended. So that's one mention where I do believe that there can be a cycle. Uh, and at the same time, to, in my experience, it's always been almost a surprise where the trust has been built. And then there's that notion of um, exchange of knowledge that is present um, in the relationship. Thanks, Fabrice. Martine? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> there's a couple of things I wanted to piggyback on. Um, I agree with Fabrice when he says that um, it's important when we are not many in a profession or a setting to kind of, sh not shelter, but care about the people who come up next. And so the image I have is, the image I paint is always that when I walk in a room where no one has looked like me before, I keep the door, I make sure the door is open, stays open for someone else to, to come in. But that comes with a responsibility. And I think even if we're informal mentors, we do have a responsibility when we walk into an environment where we are the first or the second to make sure we don't leave a stink, um, <laughs> to make sure that um, we set a tone, we set an example, we, st we set a standard. And it's kind of full circle because when, this is what I take from mentorship from my parents, setting a tone, setting a, a, um, a standard. And, and so I think that's important. And also um, we were speaking of a sponsorship before. I think that is as important as mentorship. So the difference, of course, is sponsorship. Being someone sponsors means you're hyping them up when, when they're not around, uh, which is what um, Madeleine does for Fabrice. Um, Madeleine does for many of us and continues to do for many of us. Um, that also is important. But I would say to to younger folks who are looking for guidance and, and, and mentorship, put yourself in a position where you can be sponsored. Uh, that means we have to know about what you're doing. We have to know what you're aspiring to, where you're inspiring, you're ins inspired to be, aspire to be, excuse me. And so there is also work that needs to be done on that front. Um, I'll give you an example. I, someone applied um, at, at Edelman, didn't get the position, but she had a fantastic background, fantastic resume. And she reached out to me even after not getting the position. And she said, by the way, um, I had mentioned how I was working on my master's. It's done. Here it is. And so it allows me to know, to, find, to discover more about her, more about her work and more about what she, about more of, of what she's into. And then I had asked her, what's your perfect job? What's your perfect company? And I keep that in mind. And so the minute that I am in a, in a situation where I will be able to hype her up, I will. And so it's, it's a give and take relationship. Um, I, I need to know what your dream position is, what your dream job, your dream, dream company is so I can help you. So it really is a partnership. Thanks, Martine. I think that's a perfect segue to some questions about 
how you see yourselves as, as mentors in your own right. Of course, we've been talking about the role mentorship has had in your career or life formation. And um, so transitioning to kind of talking about yourselves as mentor, we have we are getting some questions from the audience. And one of them is, um, what is the most important personality trait a mentor can have? And what aspects uh, of a person have you seen make them a good mentee? I can start with that one. Um, I, I am the author of Radical Empathy, so I think you know what my answer is going to be. <laughs> but um, I believe in um, empathy uh, is really important, and um, you know, being able to actually you know try to understand that person's experience is, is really important because I have had. I mean, not every mentoring experience is a good one. And, you know, I have had people tell me things that just did not fit with my, you know, integrity or, or worldview or whatever. And so it's important to keep in mind that you need to understand where that person is coming from. So my, you know, for me as a, a mentor, it's important for me to not make assumptions about the person I'm talking to, especially, you know, even if it's another Black person, I, I cannot assume that their life experience is the same as mine and vice versa. So as a mentee, um, I think it's also you know, incumbent upon me not to make assumptions about somebody and, you know, and to really so that it, along with empathy, it's curiosity and being willing to take a step back and not impose your judgment on somebody until you've had it, you know, use your, your, you know, ask questions, you know, learn more about them. And I think that's what Fabrice was kind of getting at is, you know, oftentimes you, know, you develop a relationship with a person and you get to know them before you become a mentor or a mentee. And so I think that's important is to get to know people. It's not just something you jump into. And so, you know, being, willing to be open to that other person's experiences and not to make a set, uh, you know, judgments um, or assumptions about somebody when you are first meeting them and to get to know them better. So, and there. Empathy, absolutely. <laughs> David? Uh, yes, I love what uh, Terry said. And I, and I think um, uh, one uh, other aspect of that that's important, a little bit in, in line with what I was saying earlier, was that you know, it's, sometimes it's hard for us to make the step to where the other person is at. You know? So when you're offering mentorship to someone who's young um, or to someone who doesn't have your experience, uh, you have to try to, try to be you know, humble and mindful of the fact that they are at a whole nother level that they might not be able to digest some of the information that you're offering. Uh, so, you know, to, to be mindful of where they are and try to meet them where they are a bit. Uh, so that's on the side of the mentor and on the side of the um, protege or a mentee is, is, is drive. You know, what you, you had a question, what is, a, you know, um, the best advice that a mentor ever gave you? And I, I like that one of my mentors basically told me that the key, one of the, the biggest keys to success is to bust your behind. You have to work hard and you have to want it. And so that curiosity, that drive, um, along with some humility, enough humility to be able to listen to your mentors and recognize that you could use some guidance. Those I see, I think, would be uh, the great, uh, good characteristics of a, of a person seeking mentorship. I, I would you. say that, uh, oh, you were about to say something, Anna? I was just gonna thank David and turn it over to you also. Perfect, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, like the, I like the fact that the question talks about the mentor and mentee characteristics both, and I'll, I'll focus on the mentee aspect. Um, I believe that um, there's, there's not that much growth and learning if it's always comfortable. So, which is quite, which makes it quite difficult because I fully agree that sometimes some um, comments or messages or advice may not resonate with us as a mentee. And, and, and at, in, in, in certain con contexts, it does make sense to dismiss what is proposed. But sometimes the pain comes from the truth that um, invites you to the next version of, of who you want to become. 
and that's never easy. Not in, uh, well, in my experience, this is never easy. There's always that, oh my God, I mean, I've never thought of that. And it's painful to move on to the next, that next step. So there's no specific formula, but I do believe that a mentee characteristic is the willingness to engage with that um, difficulty of discomfort and, and really dive into what that unknown can become until it becomes something that is integrated as a new skill or a new piece of wisdom and whatnot. Um, so it's not to always dismiss or always accept, it's to trust yourself and try to find, well, the pain, does it come from something that doesn't resonate or something that you're protecting, you're defensive about and you need to open up? That's very insightful. Martine. Yes, I, I think um, the Fabrice said it, there's no there's no as secret formula, and I think that's right. I, I think there's not one way to do it. I think there are many ways to do it. Um, in my case, I know that, and it's true that sometimes it's painful. So you you have to be open to receive. If you're open to give, you have to be open to receive the criticism, and certainly, you know, I've put myself in a situation where my mentor has been able to say, well this was not the right way to go or you should have done it a different way. Um, I, I think also that we have to realize it really is a partnership. So you have to put, and again, you have to put as much as you want to get out. And I say that because, you know, if you have a meeting with your mentor, don't show up late. Your mentor is there on time, be there on time as well. Um, if you're given an assignment, do it. Um, and, you know, in the same token, I would say that um, I know that I'm I'm a better sponsor than I am a better mentor uh, because I'm always so proud to hype someone up. That brings me so much joy to say you should connect with so and so. That's what that's part of my work anyhow, and I this is something I do well better than than being a mentor. Uh, but I will say that there is value in being an unofficial mentor. And I know I have many unofficial mentor that I've never spoken to, but I watch them go. I read what they write. I listen to what they say. I watch their work. And I know that they've gotten to where they've gotten by hard work, blood, sweat, and tears, passion, empathy, integrity. You can tell. So sometimes you follow someone's career and they're your, they're your mentors. They show you the way. There's a lot of value in that because I think one of the one of the hurdles for many sometimes is perhaps to have this proximity to a mentor, proximity to someone that they wish to be close to, but there's still a way to get to get information uh, or to get um, influence from these people, even if you don't know them. I know for I know that was the case for me. There are people that have been extremely influential in my career. In, I mean, that have almost given me a blueprint. But I've never met them. They don't even know I exist. But I've been following them so closely, like sitting in a class. I've been studying them and, and taking that with me and applying it to my life. Thanks for that. Um, that's actually a perfect segue to a question that we've gotten from the audience, which I think you've, you've partially answered with what you said about sort of studying people from afar piece. But um, someone asked, what if you don't have someone that... Uh, Look, looks like you or comes from a similar background to you within your organization, how do you go about reaching across uh, uh, organizations or sectors looking for that mentorship or, or sponsorship? I mean, if, if I may just to, to go back to what I said, and I, and I absolutely love this question because I think that is uh, the reality for most of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have to have a, a, an answer. But you know, it's I think I, I think with all the information that we have access to, there's a way to to dive into some someone's life and how to even without meeting them. And this is why when you're asked, you know, who do you look who you look up to? Most a lot of the times these are people we've never met. So I, I and one of the homeworks I often give clients who are you know, particularly CEOs and, and, you know, if they want to make adjustments to how they lead. And I always say, show me a leader around the world 
whom you like to not copy, but who inspires you. And then from that, we can break it down and say, okay, well, why does that leader inspire you? And then deep, you know, dig, dig deep into the how and the why. And I think it's the same for even on a, even on a, on a not so grandiose level, there's a way to, to be inspired and to be, to be mentored again, once again, by people we've never met. We have the tools for it. We certainly have the tools for it. Um, I would mention one quick note is that I must say it is true that Martin is an amazing sponsor. <laughs> so I have this, uh, I'm adding a test, my own personal testimony on that front. So that's one uh, parenthesis. Thanks, uh, Fabrice. <laughs> um, in addition to that, um, I do agree that many people that we look up to are people that we see in the public sphere and that um, if we study them, you, we get to know the person enough not to know them probably intimately but enough in terms of what makes them professionally successful so that's one um aspect the the second part is i mean um if you're looking for a mentor and you don't find that person in your own organization in my experience networking has been a way i mean uh, doing the work of being out there in your own field so whether it be business, law, um, community building, uh, academics, you know, whatnot. Being up, there are these networks where if you're there in the traffic, you don't go there to find a person, but you're there to be in the traffic and meet people. And then you'll meet the people that you'll connect with um, and, and with whom it will resonate um, and to the point where more intimate relationships will, will arise. And the last thing that I, that I have in mind is I also do believe that um, I hope that really, it might sound silly, but in Quebec, um, there's no person that is not approachable. I do believe in, there's 8 million people. It's not like we're not 8 um, a billion. And in my experience, you're, everybody is one, two, three, four steps away from, from the, that one person that you want to meet. And, and you know, Funny, the, the only one person that I've never managed to meet was P.K. Subban because he was probably unapproachable. But any other person, there's always a way, even more with technology, because now you have access. And you don't want to be a stalker. That, that, that's not what I'm saying. But I guess that to, to really show your passion of what you want to learn about, if you carry yourself in a way that shows that you're driven, and going back to what you said, uh, David, I, people will pay attention. And they may not have a full hour. They, not, they may not have... A, a, you know, two hours. I remember I met with someone at McGill University, Terry, you probably know her, Anita Novak, um, who uh, writes about empathy and is a teacher at McGill. I remember that the first, when I met her, uh, funnily, and, and I'll go with that story, um, Madeleine is the one person who told me to meet Anita. And I had her card. I met with, uh, with Anita at an event and Anita was busy. She told me that she couldn't meet me in the next in the next three months and to wait until I don't I don't know, probably four or five, six months, which I did. So which showed that, that perseverance. And she told me that she had 15 minutes to meet. And I showed up and ultimately we spent two hours and she's now become a friend. But what led to that was the, the perseverance to know that I would I was willing to wait six months for 15 minutes. And then probably, yes, yeah, she, she noticed that I was interested. And then this built up to a relationship that went far beyond the initial steps. So that perseverance and that willingness to actually meet the people, mentors resonate with that. If people reach out to me, I may not have an hour, but I'll, I'll, I'll respond to your DM. I'll, I'll, re, I'll do something to acknowledge your request. And I, I, I just want to say that the equation that Fabrice referred to, that we're all in Quebec, one, two, or three uh, degrees away of separations from each other. That is particularly true if your name is Fabrice Ville. That's all <laughs> I want to say. <laughs> That's great. Um, I just wanted to follow up on what I was to say um, about, so yes, I do know Anita Nowak, and we actually met on LinkedIn. <laughs> so um, LinkedIn has actually been a, a great way to, to meet a lot of folks um, kind of outside of academia, even though Anita is part of academia. But um, the networking component, when I was a graduate student, um, you know, I, there weren't a lot of black women, <laughs> certainly not in my department at UCLA and, and more broadly in, in academia and political science. And 
So, um, you know, my first step was to find out who are the people who are doing research that is of interest to me. And so I would go to our conferences and just show up at their panels and introduce myself afterwards. And, um, you know, then uh, one of my professors gave me some funding to invite people to, I was at UCLA, so to invite people to UCLA to give talks. And um, that's how I started to build my network is, but going to the conferences and actually meeting, you know, hopefully we'll get back to the point where conferences are regularly in person because it's those hallway conversations and walking up to somebody after their panel presentation and, you know, giving their card. But for those who are watching right now, um, I'm on LinkedIn. Feel free to, to reach out if you're, you want to connect that way since we aren't in person. But um, I would say that the networking um, and, you know, of course, I was reaching out to people who weren't black for the most part because that's my field is just not um, there's not a lot of people. Uh, studying, you know, European politics and immigration politics. Um, and so uh, it was really helpful to start to develop those relationships. Um, and, you know, at the time handing out cards, now you can just uh, connect via LinkedIn or, or send an email and um, don't be discouraged. Like Fabrice said, you know, be persistent. Uh, it's really important because I tell people, you know, my email's often a mess and I have a hard time keeping track of it. So um, don't give up, you know, go to social media and send a DM. Um, things like that are, are really helpful to make, start to build those connections and networks. But also if it's somebody you don't know, just to follow them and, and you know, learn from them on uh, social media is another way to go about it. Thank you. I, I do agree that the Quebec network is is tight. It is true. <laughs> I know Anita uh, as well. We were actually in a fellowship uh, uh, program uh, together and I learned of Terry uh, through her and through uh, another McGill contact. So small world, um, which is which is great from a, a mentoring and networking perspective. Um, we have another question from the audience that uh, says this question can be for everyone, um, but I'd like to direct it initially at David Shelton. I'm involved in student government at my university, and I'm wondering if you have in mind an initiative during your time in student politics that was the most important or most impactful, uh, specifically in regard to improving equity and inclusivity in your school community. In my time, um, we're going back to the to the early '80s, and you know, um, if the question is uh, um, what. In my time, the initiative was anti-apartheid. And so, and it was also the very first Martin Luther King Day holiday. And this was a, uh, a tremendous era to be involved in student government and to be organizing uh, around these issues that, that were critically important that underline, you know, um, the, the, you know our, our value as human beings and our, our full humanity. We also wanted to address the curriculum, the general education curriculum to make it more inclusive. So we, we worked hard on those issues and it was a lot like what I'm hearing uh, come up about the tenacity as Fabrice mentioned, Fabrice and, and, and others, uh, this idea that you, you know, these issues and the delays and the postponements you have to be willing to outlast that. You have to be determined and dogmatic and, and, and engaged and address these things in as many ways as possible. And also like the question about uh, the, the, you know, the mentors when you don't have one nearby, making, building a composite group of mentorship by you know, the sheer drive to learn and become better and become the you know, um, more well-versed. But as it relates to student government, that's what we were dealing with at the time. And we recognized as well that as students, we, uh, we wanted to speak up for uh, the student body, but also for the faculty, also for the staff of the university, because we were the ones who had the voice to do so. And so we were, um, you know, at that time there was a demographic shift and I was at a very unique school. I won't uh, go uh, too far into it, but a school that had changed its demographic drastically uh, in this inner city of Detroit. Uh, and it had been a all girls uh, college um, and essentially all white. And then, you know, uh, things changed. They opened up their doors 
and uh, and you know the average age went way up. We had childcare issues. We had all kinds of issues that did not exist previously that we had to address. So yes, just trying to be as organized as we could and to seek other engaged students who want to help with the, with these uh, dossiers. And I was, you know, it, it was a wonderful experience for me. And, uh, and I hope your student government experience is as enriching as mine. I hope that answers your question to some degree. Thanks, David. Terry, I know you've been, you're in academia. I wondered if you could give your uh, perspective of how you've seen students make an impact. Um, I think sometimes student, students don't realize the power that they have. Um, they, you know, they are the reason we're there <laughs> and, um, and their voices matter. And so, you know, I was, along with David, my time in uh, student leadership was during the same era and I was involved with Stanford out of South Africa and, and so on. And, um, you know, and again, the persistence factor. So Stanford didn't get out of South Africa, you know, those two years we were protesting in front of the president's office, but they did eventually. And that was, you know, one of the factors that led up to the end of apartheid. And so I, I think that what is important is to understand, even if you don't get what you asked for, you know, today or tomorrow, you have to keep pushing. And it's important to develop the networks because you, you may only be in school for four years or three years or five years, however long it may be, that you're, you know, you're pulling people along with you who will continue the battle. So it's really important to make those connections because especially if it's an important battle, um, you know, like the fact that we're, we're just getting going, I should mention I'm the Provost Academic Lead and Advisor at McGill on the strategy to address anti-Black racism. And this is something students and faculty at McGill have been demanding since, you know, this anti-Black racism strategy and you know, developing Black studies and so on, something since the 1960s. And so, you know, it, it took a long time, but it's happening and it's partly because of the way the students persisted and continually asked you know, never gave up asking for what they needed. And so now we're seeing that that change actually happening. And so again, it may take a while, but it's important to maintain those connections and understanding the history and the role that students can play. I think this would be a good segue into uh, a question on reverse mentorship, this idea of being mentored by by the next generation have any of you benefited from uh, I, i've heard i've heard uh themes of it throughout our, our event but i would love to hear your thoughts on how you've you've benefited or grown from reverse mentorship um in my case i'm i feel i'm extremely lucky because i work in an environment where i'm surrounded by people who are uh, much younger than i am um and I think there's a principle that we cannot forget. We, we push for diversity and inclusion. And diversity and inclusion means diversity as well in age groups. Um, and for me, there is absolutely richness in being with folks that are younger than I am and folks that are older than I am. I, I've kind, you know, I was saying before how you can be mentored even without knowing the person and from a distance. That's how I feel about being reversely mentored by, by younger folks. And for me, I see a lot, you know, particularly when there are hot issues. And I see how the power of Gen Z to organize, um, to be persistent, um, to really be able to um, utilize and the best ability, the communication tools that we have today. And I look at that and, I'm, and I go, okay, it's impressive. What can I learn from that? And I, I've been, for the past two years, for me, it's like, been, it's like I was sitting in class again, watching uh, people who are younger than me and who I find get it much better than I got it uh, when I was their age. And so in that sense, I think, and because of, of these communication tools that bring us closer, there's a way to have these exchanges 
these really rich exchanges with 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 people who can teach us and and i and i really do feel like i've been in a reverse mentorship uh um position for two years for at least two years Thank you so much. I, I couldn't agree more. I think the last two years have been an opportunity for many of us to be called uh, to, to leadership in responding to uh, how the next generation has been engaging on, on all of the, the global and local pressing issues of our day. Do any of our other panelists want to chime in on this? Um, thank you. Sorry, Fabrice. I would say that I, what right now I find myself in a, in a steep uh, curve of uh, reverse mentorship. Uh, uh, we are working on, you know, I know that this is uh, broadly broadcast, but we're working on uh, re-establishing a cultural and community center uh, in my neighborhood that has existed for nearly a hundred years. And in this process, I have a chance to work with people of all generations and the young dynamic people are just blowing my mind right now, turn, uh, introducing me to, uh, to concepts and approaches that, uh, that I had not thought of before. And I find it so stimulating uh, to be with them and to hear their points of view and to see how they, you know, sort of conjugate, uh, you know, our history, our future and, and their vision for what they want. I'm just so inspired by them. And I think, uh, you know, uh, I'm just so grateful for this opportunity to have time with them. So. Yes, whether it be in a specific realm that I'm not familiar with, like yours, Martin, uh, you know, of, of communications and to see how they put concepts together. I just, like you say, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm back in school and uh, loving it. So, uh, so yeah, reverse mentorship is wonderful for me. Um, I would also say two things. Um, one, uh, being an entrepreneur, um, after um, spending a few years as an employee in, in the workplace has given me in a fairly short uh, span of time access to both the position of the mentee and not the mentee, but the employee in the workplace and having, you know, questions, requests, needs in terms of what I want to see in the workplace. And very quickly, it shifted to uh, the position where um, in my context, and my colleagues are mostly younger than myself, um, in, I'm in a position to uh, be more empathetic to the leaders that I had um, when I used to be an employee. That's one part. But also um, to be in a position where I'm invited to understand better what's the need of a, a person who's in the workplace and who wants to thrive and, and wants to be happy. So, and I must say that this, not, this is not an easy position to be in because um, as an entrepreneur, my first goal initially has always been to for the, the, the vision and the mission of the organization and not to dismiss the, 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 the culture and the workplace, but that came second in how I, I saw myself as an entrepreneur. Initially, I was the only one person in the organization. So the reverse mentorship came in that context. And, and I, I would also add that uh, the second part is probably more directly and more explicitly, being an uncle has been, you know, I have nieces and nephews and, you know, sorry for my, my language, but there's no bullshit with them, right? It's, it's, you know, whenever I try to impose something on them, there's a direct reaction. So it's a, it's a, it's probably one of the most vivid and clear um, invitation to be listening and to, to really focus on what the person wants. Um, so I have many, many nieces and nephews, and that's where I get most of um, my challenges as an as an individual in terms of how I relate to others. I I I I second that. It's it's the same thing for for me, Fabrice. And I'll add that we've mentioned empathy before, and I wonder if it isn't the generation behind us who have made us maybe not you, Terry, because you, you've you've studied it and you've written on it. But I know for myself, I, I, it always comes first now. And I'm pretty sure that comes directly from being surrounded and listening to people who are younger than me, for whom it matters, it's a priority. And it's to have that, pers that perspective first, empathy is a game changer. And this is one of these things I regret learning so late 
or not applying more um, uh, before. And I think when I look at leadership today, um, it has it is dictated, and rightly so, by the younger generation. So I think the winning combination is our is experience because I don't want to dismiss, I don't want I I can't and will not dismiss. Uh, the older generation that has paved the way and has set a, t a, a tone uh, and, and really did give us a blueprint. But I think the winning combination is a marriage of this and the younger generation. And so um, there's, you know, I think there every generation has something to bring and and the, the homework is to to pull the best out of each generation and, and apply it. So there is something for everyone. There really is from anyone from everyone and for everyone well we've got a little over uh, our time and i wish you could see there are so many nice uh, comments coming streaming in on how inspired our audience feels uh, listening to the insights of our panelists um we have been uh We've been scrolling quotes uh, from uh, Black uh, Canadian and American leaders uh, as the event has been uh, going through as well. And right now going across uh, is empathy is a game changer, Martin Saint-Victor. Um, so uh, you all have just given us so many nuggets to, to really uh, chew on. And I just wanna thank you. And I wanna open the mic uh, for each of you uh, who are just trailblazers in your own right, not just in terms of the, the substantive fields that you are a part of, but also in uh, opening the door and creating opportunities within your organizations and the work you've pursued uh, to make organizations more equitable, more inclusive, and more diverse. So I want to just express appreciation for that work and for your presence with us today and, and ask uh, if you would share one nugget of just advice for for our audience as we as we close uh, I'll, i can go anna so um i always say respect the process and so that comes comes back to being patient being persistent being um eye on the ball the distractions are just that distraction but do respect the process you know things that matter take time um and that's really, I think, a lesson that's that we can all apply. Great. I would say, uh, I would say, but you know, absolutely believe, believe um, that you will find your way. Uh, believe that uh, you know, following your passion will bring you uh, to where you are supposed to be. And uh, and don't give up. You have to. I mean, sometimes the path takes turns. Sometimes there are forks in the road, um, but uh, my mother had a quote uh, that she loved to, I don't know who it's attributed to, but that the universe is unfolding exactly as it should. Uh, I, I love that, that quote, it sustains me a lot. And uh, knowing that uh, there's a place for you and that your, uh, your efforts um, are, are, are worthwhile and they, and they will bring you value all of your days. That's been my experience. I can go next. Um, so my uh, next favorite word after empathy is integrity. And um, to me, integrity it has several different meanings. And it's not just about you know being honest and truthful. It's also about maintaining uh, integrity in terms of your health, in terms of your your mental capacities, and um, you know maintaining who you are you know, in the face of the constant barrage we face of, you know, microaggressions and, and not so microaggressions. And so, um, you know, that's something that's been important to me throughout the years. And I learned from my parents to, you know, kind of have that solid core of integrity that um, keeps me from, you know, you know, losing track of who I am and uh, what is what things are important to me. So that's my piece of advice. Um, I do resonate with the, uh, the notion of integrity a lot. Um, it may sound, uh, you know, we're four panelists here talking about our own experience. And I do, I do still to this day listen to panels and, 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 and speakers. Um, 
And I always try to remember that um, I'm just trying to be myself, and uh, which is easy and not at the same time. But I do remember the 15-year-old Fabrice just like yesterday and the four-year-old Fabrice just like yesterday. And I'm still that young kid trying to do what I live my life to the best of my ability. So what I would just like for those listening to honor their own integrity and who they are, uh, which is which is simple, but at the same time, very, very hard. Um, so I wouldn't certainly like anybody to be like me. I would like people to be like who they want to be. Thank you. Respect the process. Believe that following your passion will bring you to where you're supposed to be. Maintain a solid core of integrity and in who you are in the face of constant barrage. Be yourself, honor who you are. I think that we can close on, on that inspiring note with deep gratitude to, to you all and wishing everyone uh, a thoughtful, reflective and happy Black History Month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. This has been great.